Got screens out. <laughs> Light of fire. Amen. Which is the theme of this message this week and also of next week. The idea of uh, just, you know, it's, it's time to shine. Amen. You know, a lot of people have a, a little struggle with this in their spiritual walk in life and they often come back with these questions, well, what's the secret of this, and how can you know this, and what does it take to be this kind of, you know, I know what the Bible says, I'm supposed to be this kind of on-fire believer, and, you know, uh, you know and they, they kind of approach it like there's, they see some people who are living that way, and they're not living that way, they want to know what the secret is. Well, there's no secrets. <laughs> these things have been made known. It's if we want to see them, if we want to hear them, if we want to if we want to, to understand them, it's very, very clear. I'm always amazed how many people say something like, well, that's your interpretation. Well, folks, if, if, a, if the sign on the, on the page says, uh, it, this is red, uh, how do you interpret that? It's red, all right? <laughs> so it, it's not, there's no private interpretation when it comes to these things in Scripture. It's just a matter of will we, will we read it? Will we see it? Will we believe it? Will we, will we step into it? And as we do that, and God begins to do something. The, the secret to lighting a fire, I think, is that the simplicity of, of living for Jesus and resting in Jesus and following Jesus, loving Jesus. That, like, that's, that's pretty much it. So you see, it's, it's not a big secret, is it? It's a reality. But I want to talk about this today, and I, I, I want to restate some things that you know very, very, very well. well. And you may even ask yourself in the context of me going over the first several points here, why is he telling this again? All right? I know this. Bear with me in my folly. Stay with me. Follow the logic of what I'm saying today. Because at the end, you'll see you can light a fire. You can shine. You can be, you can be bold. You can be deliberate in your life. You can have direction. You can live with intent and purpose like you never have at any other time. But let's not get away. The apostle wrote to the, Coloss to the folks at Colossae and he said, listen, be not removed from the simplicity which is found in Jesus Christ. It's amazing, at least for me, how I can make it so difficult sometimes and so hard when it is not that way at all, except in my perception and my understanding. Let's get back to the scripture and what the, does the Bible teach. There's a passage in John 15 that, that, that lays it out like this. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But how do you interpret that? <laughs> Pretty simple. Can't live life without Jesus. Can't live for Jesus without Jesus. If you don't abide in me, you're thrown away as a branch and dried up and they gather them and cast them in the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. He said, there's a way, there's an evidence that can be seen testified to that you really are my disciples. How is it? You'll bear much fruit. That's where you prove you're a disciple. That's the evidence that flows from your life. It's not that you make fruit, it's that fruit happens. I have a couple of fruit trees in my yard. They're not toiling. They're not struggling. They're just, you hear, in a couple of weeks, they're going to start popping blossoms. Pop, pop, pop. And then the leaves are going to start filling it around those, and then all of a sudden fruit's going to start popping out. I didn't, I'd never heard one of them say the other, oh, you think we can do this? I don't know, it's so hard. I know what it says, but I, I don't know if, I know it says that, you know, we're, we're fruit trees, and so fruit's supposed to, to come, but I don't know if I can do it this year. You know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to try. Fruit, 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 fruit. <laughs> I'm thinking fruit, I'm confessing fruit. I'm believing fruit. No, it just, it, it, there's a flow that takes place because those roots are abiding in the right place and they're functioning the way they're supposed to, to, to function and they're bringing nutrition up through the tree. It's gonna happen, fruit's gonna come. It's the nature of that tree to bear fruit. As a Christian, it's in your nature to bear fruit. Now there's. When the Bible talks about fruit, we've, we've dealt with this before, that there are two different aspects it's referring to. The first has to do with the fruit of the Spirit. 
What is that? Well, in a nutshell, that's just Jesus coming through. All right? The love, the kindness, the patience, the joy, the temperance, the long suffering. That's just Jesus manifesting his life through your personality, manifesting his life through your vessel. That's the fruit of the Spirit. If you're abiding in Jesus, guess who comes up? Guess who shows up? Guess what comes out? Jesus does. What if you're not abiding in Jesus? You got nothing. That's what it says here. Without me, you can't, you, nothing, you, there's nothing, there ain't nothing. It's just not gonna work. But if you abide in me, you bear much fruit. Now, I believe, specifically speaking, the fruit that it's talking about in the context of everything going on in John here, as he's approaching the end of his ministry on the earth, his physical ministry is coming to an end, that he is telling his disciples, hey, what's gonna happen now you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to rest in me and you're going to trust in me and you're going to follow me. You're going to cling to me. You're going to hold on to me. And what's going to happen because your roots are rooted in me is that fruit's going to show up. Now, not just the presence and the personality of Jesus, but I believe, again, in the context, of this, he's talking about other people coming to Christ because he begins to talk to them about these latter days and what he's facing and where he's going. He shows up later after this event of the cross, three days later, and begins to tell them about this mission that they're called to embark upon and how they're supposed to live their lives now and go make disciples. All that's fruit. That's just what happens in the course, in the context of us abiding in Jesus. That, that lives are being changed, that hearts are being touched, that people are coming to know Christ, that difference is being made in my life, in my wife's life, in my children's life, in my grandkids' life, and where I work and where I go and where I shop and where I... If I'm really abiding in Jesus, fruit starts coming. Fruit starts happening. You say, well, I, I'm kind of a fruitless fruit myself. You know, I, I'm not bearing any fruit. Maybe because you're not abiding. Maybe because you're not resting in him. Maybe because you're not spending time with him and maybe not loving him and committing to him the way you've been called to. Now, I just want to reaffirm some things and, and follow the logic with me this morning. And if you believe it every once in a while, it really won't hurt to say amen. Doesn't hurt, does it, Margaret? Feels good, doesn't it? Amen. Let's try it all together. One, two, three. Amen. All right. Now, let's see if you can continue that. First of all, we believe that there is no hope, according to this passage, let me do nothing, there's no hope for real life without Jesus Christ. Why? Because without him, we're nothing. Without him, we're separated from God. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All right? There's none that doeth good, no, not one. No, there's no, and nobody's ever born a Christian. To be a Christian, you've got to be born again. All right. So first time birth doesn't work. You can't get it by osmosis. You can't get it by sitting in Bible study. You can't get it by coming to church. You can't get it by listening to Pastor Joe. It just doesn't happen that way. It happens when you surrender your life to Christ and you're made new. I believe with all my heart, the Bible makes a very clear, uh, clear lesson to all of us. If we choose to believe it, choose to read it. It's simply what it says. We're lost without God. We're sinners without Christ. There is no hope for us. In fact, there's no, there's no hope in, in eternity, obviously because we've sinned against God, and because we're sinners, we can't quite match and meet up to the expectation of God's holiness and his righteousness and his glory because we have fallen way short, all right? The glory of man, the Bible says, is like grass. It doesn't last, in other words. The glory of God is bright and eternal. The glory of man will never reach this level. So we have to be given glory. Well, where do we get that? The Bible tells us that when we surrender our lives to Jesus, you with me? You give your heart to Christ, then you are given, according to Romans chapter 5, the gift of righteousness. In other words, that make, God makes you acceptable. Can't earn it, can't sing for it, can't preach for it, can't teach for it. It's a gift of God, right? I believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe that without Jesus, there's no hope. Now, I know that's not popular. I read an article this week that said 65% of of confessing Christians in the United States of America, 65% said they believe there's more than one way to get to heaven. I don't guess they polled our group. <laughs> they didn't ask. I didn't get the question survey, did you? If we did, we'd be in that of the 35%. They don't, they're, in other words, there are people sitting across this nation, they're filling churches up, of all kinds, all abominations and denominations that you can think of, and they're all, and many of them believe that there's more than one way to get to heaven. 
I contend, if there is more than one way, what is it? I believe the Bible teaches, we believe the Bible teaches that Jesus made it very clear, without me, you can do nothing, all right? In fact, he put it this way, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Now, I believe it. You believe it, amen? Right, we're all on the same page here. There's only one way to get to God. And what if there were 10? Well, we'd still come up with another 1,010. What if there were 23 ways to get to heaven? Oh, we'd have another 23 we'd make up ourselves. So how would we know? In the wisdom of God and in the great mind, intellect, um, omnipresent, omniscient, um, all-knowing God, wisdom dictates if you're going to get to heaven, let's make one clear way. And that one clear way is because man has a problem called sin, we have to deal with the issue of sin. So the one clear way will be that someone has to pay the price for sin. Now, if I'm going to pay the price for my sin, how am I going to do that? I have to spend eternity in hell. <laughs> There's not much hope in that, is there? Eternity means eternity. Y'all know how long that is, right? A long time. It ain't you know, getting out if it's eternity. So if I'm paying for my own sin, that means I have to, the wages of sin is what? Death. Death but the gift of God's eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So one comes who has never sinned and pays the price for the sin of everybody. Doesn't that sound more realistic? By the way, it's because on the other side, one man sinned and opened the door, gave Satan the keys, and since that time, all men were born sinners. So as one man came and blew it, now the God-man, the man-God, Jesus Christ comes and makes a way for every one of us. One way, one truth, one hope, one church, one faith, one spirit, not multitudes. That's about the weakest clapping I've heard in a long time. But not only is there no hope in life, because the fruit of the Spirit is, is life, it's joy, it's peace. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There's no hope in eternity. There's no hope in the present life. It's just, it's, there's, there's just no hope. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you're probably not even aware of it, but you haven't yet discovered life. Oh, pastor, things are good over here. Not as good as they could be. Not as full as they could be. If, that, if you were happy where you are, you quit, you quit looking at all these different avenues. You've been looking to find more fulfillment. Jesus comes and brings a real, genuine fulfillment. But we're, we're, we're in war, right? The Bible says Jesus spoke of, of the opposition. He called him the thief. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that you might have life, and that life abundantly. Full living, real life, real fullness of life is not going to come to you until you get right with God, until you surrender your heart to Christ, until you get things right with God in your life. You're just not going to live. You can pretend to have it. You can come to church and, and talk about it, and you can do Bible studies about it, but it's not going to be reality until you start abiding in Jesus Christ. Getting real. Amen. Now, I believe that. Do we believe that? There's no hope in life without Christ. There's no hope in eternity without Christ. Now, that's not just for me. That's for your grandkids. That's for your children. That's for your boyfriend. That's for your girlfriend. That's for your husband. That's for your wife. That's for your neighbor. That's for the guy at the grocery store. That's for the guy down at the restaurant. That, that's, that's for everybody. That, 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 that includes all of us. There's no hope for anybody without Jesus. All right. Now, let's go on as we build this little premise, of, logically speaking, amen, from a biblical sense. We believe Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the ultimate answer to all our dilemma, to our sin, to our future, to our eternity. Jesus Christ is the sole answer for everything. We believe that he died for our sins, rose from the dead, and we believe he is coming again. Some of us believe that. <laughs> Some of us are holding on to that hope. I believe Jesus came and lived amongst men and that he came from God and that he inhabited human form. And his name was Jesus, born of a virgin. I believe that he lived a spotless life. I believe that he went to the cross, laid down his life willingly 
for our sins. And as the apostle Paul wrote, he who knew no sin, he became sin. That you and I might be made right with God, have the righteousness of God on our life. I believe that. I mean, I really believe it with all my heart. Now, that's what we believe. We believe that's the answer. He's the answer for all. But we also believe that the Son of Man has come, that he not just came and died, he came to save that which was lost. Amen. Now, you see this, this theme going throughout the life of Jesus. I'm here, not for myself. I'm here, not to be served. I'm here. For, for, for you. I'm here for the lost. I'm here for the hurting. I'm here for the broken. I'm here. I'm here for all men, for all mankind, for everybody, not just for me, but that he came as a complete answer to my problem and to your problem, which was this issue about our relationship with God. He's come. Now, here's where a lot of Christians, they, they'll, they'll just jump and say amen all the way up to this point. But if we're Christians, we need to understand the next point. And if we're abiding, I think it's important we understand the next point. And you say, what is that? We believe that not only Jesus is the answer, but he has called us to the same purpose of being here to seek and to save the lost. Now, we know he's the Savior, all right? He's the Savior. Who are we? We're the seekers. Now, I know we're having modern church today, and we call it seeker sensitive, and that means that there's people out there who, you know, we, we don't want to offend, so we have to be very gentle in, in, in presenting the gospel to them and talking about issues that might offend them, so we've got to be real sensitive to, to seekers. Well, folks, we're the seekers, according to the scriptures. Saved people are the seekers. So if we're going to be seeker sensitive, then we have to be aware of lost people. I don't know how they got that all messed up. It's pretty much right there in black and white, isn't it? <laughs> Who are the seekers? We're the seekers, and we're here to do what? Seek and save the lost. We're here to look for people that don't know Jesus, have our, have our antennas out, to people that might know, not know Christ around us, to be aware of people within our community, within, within our sphere of influence that might not know Jesus so that we can do something to get them moving in the right direction. He's called us for this. And those, were the, those were the parting words. A lot of people call this the great commission. I call it the great commandment. You know? And Jesus came up to them and said to them, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go. Therefore, what do we do? We go, we make disciples of the nations. We baptize them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We teach them to serve the things we've been commanded. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Why? Because he's the ultimate seeker. And we're out there seeking with him. But I think somehow we're, we're waiting, you know. People say, well, you know, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to open the door. What are you doing inside? <laughs> Get out. Get away from the doors. Get out in the world. Live what you believe. If you believe it, then live it. If you believe that Jesus is the answer for man's sin, if Jesus is the answer to keep people from going to hell, if Jesus is the answer for people getting in heaven, if Jesus is really the answer, and I truly believe that and say amen to everything I've said, then we have to believe the rest of it. Amen. That every one of us have been called by God to, to realize, hey, there's a lot of hurting folks around me. And God, I, and here's, here's what I have to pray off of. God, make me aware of people today. Why? Because I am so prone as you are to get so preoccupied with the affairs of this world that I miss the most important affairs of the real world. You can say amen to that. Isn't it, isn't it true? We get so wrapped up in schedules, appointments, and everything else, we realize that, hey, there's a higher appointment we have to keep in mind in the process of doing all that we're doing. God has called us to the same purpose that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. He says, now you go seek and save that which is lost. How do we do it? We take the message. It's a message. It's the good news. It's the gospel. And if it's good news, it's good news. Now, let me, let's not stop there because a lot of people will, will wrestle with this issue. You have to understand that not only has he called you that, and, and you sit back and you start sensing, oh, I've been called. Oh, I feel so helpless. I feel so useless. I don't know if I can do this. All these things come rushing in our mind. You have to understand the Bible makes it very clear that, that we have to understand and we must believe that he has equipped us for this mission already. You don't have to sit around and wait for another blessing. You've been blessed already with all spiritual blessings. He said here, he's giving you a new identity. He says, you're the salt of the earth. 
the salt becomes tasteless or saltless, then it, what's good, it's, it's not good for anything again. It's no longer good for anything. It's just to be thrown out and, and trampled or cast under foot of men. He said, no, no, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In other places, he made the same references to the fact of light and salt. What, what are those? Those are just elements of influence. In other words, you're to, to be an influence in the world around you. We have a lot of people, even today, who are running for positions of influence. We're getting ready. We have a presidential campaign that's going on. And, and people are wanting to, the influence to be the president because that's a very influential position around the world. But I want you to know we've already been elected, according to the scriptures, to an office of influence. All right? We've been given an office of influence. And I'll share with you just a moment what the actual title for that is in scripture. But that has already happened. When you gave your life to Christ, something happened. That's where we understand what, what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians. For it's any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. What happened when I got saved? I got made new. Well, what's new? A lot of things are new. You know, a new life, new eyes, new ears. I hear differently, I can see differently. I, I, I can sense differently than I used to sense before I gave my life to Christ. I have a new ability to perceive things that I didn't have the ability to perceive before. I can see the end of things that I couldn't see the end of things before. I, I can see what's behind me that I couldn't see before. I begin to see now why things happen the way they happen because now I have this vision to be able to even perceive what happened in the past in my life. I mean, I, there's just been all kinds of radical change that's gone on in your life. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. But you say, Brother Joe, the old things keep trying to crawl up out of the grave they passed away to. I know they do. That's why the apostles said we die daily. We come to the place of death every day. But he goes on to say, hey, all these things that are new, they're from God. A bunch of God things, that's the new things. What's that? You got a God mind. You got a, you got a God perspective. You got a God heart now. You got a God passion. God put all this stuff in you. You wouldn't want him if he hadn't done something in you. All these things are from God. And what, what's it here? Here's where we get to this. We talked about this place of sphere of influence that God's called us to. He says now he calls us ministers of reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God. So I've been brought to God. And now it says, now I'm giving you a ministry of reconciliation. What's that mean? I bring others to God. That's all that means. I was brought to God. I bring others to God. I've been given this ministry of reconciliation, not counting, praise God, my trespasses against me, nor do I count other people's trespasses against them. I bring them to Jesus. Jesus deals with the trespass issue. He takes them away from me. He saves us. And now he has committed unto us what? He's changed our heart and he's given us something. He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. What's that? That's just what I've been talking to you about the last 15 minutes, the gospel. Jesus came. Son of God, spotless Lamb of God. He came, he was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and died for our sins. Took my place and took your place at Calvary. And not only take your place at Calvary, then he changed your heart and changed your life. And not only has he changed you, reconciled you is the word he's here. Now he's given you something, new life with a new message. A new message, a word of reconciliation. A word that helps people to come to know God. He says, in fact, now I'm not only give you a word, I'm going to give you a title. You are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. You're ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador is a selected by a government to represent that government, nation, or kingdom. We have been selected by God. He's equipped us for this mission. He's made us salt and light. He's given us his Holy Spirit and has called us to this new mission. And every one of us that claim and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, you are an official ambassador for the kingdom of God. That's a high position. That's a glorious position. That ought to excite us. It ought not scare us. I'm shy, whatever. No. Here's the best part of this. In this equipping process, God inhabits your life. Do you not know, apparently some didn't know, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, yes. whom you have from God, yes. that you're not your own. Hallelujah. He goes on to say, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. That's the last of James 5. He says, glorify God. James 15, here is my Father glorified. But you bear much fruit. Glorify God. How do we glorify God? How am I going to do that? I'm resting in Jesus. I'm glorifying God because I have everything I need to be all God's called me to be. Let me say that again. I have everything I need to be all God's called me to be. 
Let's say it together. I have everything I need to be all God's called me to be. Amen. Chew on that. That'll transform your thinking. It'll transform your life. It'll transform the way you walk down the halls of your school. It'll transform the way you, you walk through your office in the places you are. It'll transform the way you're around your family. God lives in here. And praise God so I can rest in him and I can have a life in him. We believe. Believers fellowship. If we're not practicing it, we can't say we're, not, we're believing it. But we believe all we've been called now to do is to share this truth. Yes. That's what we've been called. I can't save you. You can't save me. I can't save it, but God can. But the means and the, and the method by which God has chosen, the scriptures, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching. That means we're all preachers. We're all ambassadors. We're all messengers. God's chosen the foolishness of messaging, if you want to put it that way. I have to message I have, to, I have to speak. I have to let it be known. And we have so many means, especially in this modern technological age, we have more means to message than we've ever had before. Am I using that? Am I doing anything with that? Am I, am I walking in that? It is God who's at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So catch this. Here's God says, here's, here, here, I'm, I'm saving you, changing you. I'm fitting you for the present world you live in. I'm equipping you and giving you what you need here. And I'm certainly fitting you for the world to come. I'm giving you my righteousness as well. But not only that, while you're here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do what I was doing. Keep, keep, keep messaging. Keep, keep preaching. Keep speaking. And by the way, I'm putting the Holy Spirit inside you. What more do you need than God on board? All right? This is the context of what Paul's trying to say. It's God that's working in you. He not only working, he's giving you the desire as well as the power to will and to do. In other words, he's given you the desire and the power to do what he's called you to do. Nobody's on their own. Nobody's left to themselves. Nobody, nobody's helping me. Hey, how much more help do you need than God? <laughs> Amen. But this, this is what we have to believe. We have to come to this place and I say, well, I believe that. Therefore, then, then if I'm not going to do it, then... I'll either be obedient because if I'm not obedient, my, my silence is sin. It's just sin. It's just pure disobedience to God. I mean, we're approaching Easter here and you know, we're talking, we, we talk a lot about it as we get to Easter, the trials and the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. But you know, one of the most amazing stories and heartbreaking, horrible stories in the New Testament is when Jesus, who has been so lauded and applauded by thousands who the day before laying palm leaves and declaring by Hosea, you know, Messiah, only short time later is everyone in the crowd yelling, crucify him. And he's standing there in the trial with the Sanhedrin. And even before Herod and even before, you know, Caiaphas and his group and Pilate, as he goes place to place and all these trials and mock things, happen, nobody's standing there to bear witness on his behalf. Nobody's there to say, hey, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the way to salvation. Nobody's declaring that. Isolation. No man stood to witness. Is it any less when I do that? Any less horrible? When I don't bear witness of him today? When I get so preoccupied and so wrapped up in the world around me that I just... You know, let's, no witnesses appeared for Christ. Let's, let's, let's not let that happen in our age. One of my favorite little devotional books, I kind of go back and forth from too often, is it's Oswald Chambers' book called My Utmost for His Highest. My, my mom turned me on to that book many, many years ago. Great book. If you want a good devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. And there's a follow-up to it, My Higher for His Highest or something like that. But in there, um, one of the dates, and I don't remember what day it was, but I, I was reading this the other day, and it was, the, the title of it was just a passage from Scripture that, for the devotion that day, which was Romans 14, 7. Romans 14, 7 says, <clears throat> None of us lives to himself. Uh, in, in a com more common vernacular, would be like, No man is an island unto himself. 
Now, we're living in a day and age when people do try to isolate themselves. They, 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 they don't want to join the group. They, they don't want to be a part of the family. They don't want to, you know, they, they're always hanging on the outside of the fellowship. They're always hanging on the edges. Hey, none of us list ourselves. Scripture says this very clearly. Here's what Chambers wrote. He says, has it ever dawned on you that you're responsible for others and for other souls spiritually before God? He goes on to say, for instance, if I allow any private deflection from God in my life, everyone about me suffers. He says, Scripture teaches we sit together in heavenly places. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. When once you allow physical selfishness, mental slovenliness, and moral obtuseness and spiritual density, everyone belonging to your crowd will suffer. Now, as you choose to turn your life inward, everybody around you suffers. But you say, who is sufficient for these things when you erect a standard like that? In other words, that I'm responsible for everybody. His answer, our sufficiency is of God and of him alone who wrote, you shall be my witnesses. He says, how many of you are willing to stand, to spend every ounce of your nervous energy, of your mental, moral, and spiritual energy we have for Jesus? That's the meaning of the witness in God's sense of the word, he says. It takes time. Be patient with yourself because God has left us on this earth. What for? To be saved and sanctified? No. To be at it for him. Am I willing to be broken bread? Am I willing to be poured out wine for him? To be sport, sacrificed for this age and for this life? To be spoilt for, from every standpoint but one, saving as I can disciple men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. My life as a worker is the way I say thank you to God for his unspeakable salvation. Remember, it's quite possible for any one of us to be flung out as reprobate silver, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be cast away. What's he saying? You're saved with, in, with intent. You're saved with purpose. You're saved for direction. You're saved for a reason. And yes, it's to save you, but not just you. You're saved to be part of the body of Christ. You're saved to be the voice of Christ. You're saved to be the hands and the legs and the feet and the arms of Jesus. You're saved to be in contact with people. You're saved to be in contact with lost people. You're saved to, to touch people's lives. You're saved to influence. You're saved to be light and salt. That's what the scriptures teach us. Now, I either believe this, you know, or I don't. You say, well, I don't believe that part. Then throw it all out because you can't dissect it. It's one word from God, one truth. And we embrace it or we reject it. We can't treat it like it's some kind of buffet line and pick out what I want and what I don't want, what tastes good and what doesn't taste good. And here's the tragic issue is this. Why do you think Satan fights you so hard and fights me so hard on this issue? Because he's trying to keep you separated from the, the, the bliss and the joy of seeing other people's lives changed. You know the story of Esther. We've used this passage of scripture often in our church where the kingdom of the king is has people plotting the king's her husband. He has people who are his underlings, who are his appointed officers, who are plotting behind the scenes to destroy the Jews. It's Esther, who's the young Jewish girl that's been selected to be the wife. She won the beauty contest, so to say. And now she's living in the palace quietly. And her uncle comes and says, listen, Death's getting ready to fall upon the Jewish people. You have a responsibility as a child of God to protect your people. You have a responsibility to speak up at this point in time. In fact, here's the words that he shared with her at this particular point. If you remain completely silent, Esther, at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you, your father's house, you will perish. 
Yet, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. What's he saying? God's going to d- bring deliverance. But your family's going to miss it. And this generation will miss it. A lot of Jews are going to die. And you're going to be one of them. Could it be that God raised you up, placed you in this position he's given you in your life, Esther, placed you in this palace to be an influence for the will of God and for the purposes of God? If I believe everything I've just shared with you in this message, then you and I are no different than Esther. Not a one of us in this room that claims the name of Jesus are any different. Could it be? And the answer is yes, it is. Could it be that you're here in this time, in this generation, on the planet today, just for such crucial times? Amen. Folks, the world's hurting. The world's dying more than it's ever died before. People are suffering more than they've ever suffered before. More people dying for the cause of Christ than at any other time in history. People are being beheaded. Your brothers and sisters in Christ for their commitment to the Lord. People are, are empty more than any other time. People are looking in more directions probably than any other time in human history for answers and not finding them. The New Age, popular psychology, drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, immorality. People are looking for answers, trying to find their identity. And there's no hope in the world. Because we believe the Bible is true. This is without Jesus, there's just no hope in this life or the life to come. It's just not there. Could it be that God put you where you are, in the community you're in, in the place you are, where you work, where you go, where you, where you eat, where you buy groceries, where you get gas? Could it be that God put us right where he put us sovereignly in time and eternity for such a time as this? The clock in heaven is going tick, 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 tick. And God has set things in time and in space in a very orderly way. The Bible teaches there's time and a season for everything. If you study the scriptures, you realize that the season that we are in is the last of the seasons. And the time that we are in is the last of the times. The Bible makes it clear there's going to come a time when there's no more time. And it's just going to be eternity. The scriptures talk about times and ages and where you like to talk about it, dispensations. We're in what the Bible calls a church age and makes reference to the time of the church and the bride of Christ. It's getting near the end of that time if you follow prophetic reading of scriptures and read them as they're just written without having to make anything up. It's just very clear what it says. Jesus made the statement, when you see these things come to pass, know that my coming is near even at the door. 99% of the things that Jesus prophesied would happen are now happening concurrently in our world. The global phenomena, the global disasters, the economic situations, the national situations of kingdoms and nations, the nation of Israel restored in 1948. In fact, since 1948, there have been so many prophecies fulfilled, it's just been tick, 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 tick. It's almost accelerated over any other time in history. I believe Jesus is coming again. Now, there's a lot of people who think that's a pipe dream. That just means, oh, when we die, he comes and gets us. No. Scripture makes clear, we shall not all die. There'll be a time when the Lord will appear and the dead in Christ will raise, and we that remain, those that are alive at this time, will be caught up in there to be with him. That moment's coming soon. I don't know if it's this week or tomorrow or this afternoon or next year. But it's going to tick and there's going to be an alarm sound called the trump and the church is going to be taken out. Time's not done. It's still ticking for another seven years. Tick, 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 tick. And that period is called the tribulation. That's the period, really. If you don't know what the tribulation is really all about, it's about Israel. 
and restoring them through the hardness and the stiff neckness, neckness that they've had in their lives, rejection of the Messiah. God's going to get their attention, and they're going to turn to him. And the Bible tells us that all Israel is going to be saved in one day. You say, what's that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> I just know a lot of Jews are going to get saved in a day. And I know the result of that is going to be 144,000 of them that become evangelists in a day and go to the rest of the world and preach the gospel. And the people who believe during this seven years of tick-tock, 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 they'll, they'll die for their faith. They'll be martyred. We're, we're on the edge like at no other time in history. Now, I know some of you say, well, Brother Joe, I've been coming to church here as long as this church has been here, and you've been saying that every year. One day you're going to show up here and Brother Joe's not going to be here. <laughs> going to be gone. Church going to be partially empty. Hopefully, hopefully a whole lot empty. But there will still be some folks come to church that Sunday morning. Where did everybody go? <laughs> Only the redeemed are going to go at the sound of that trump. But what an opportunity we have. We need a light of fire in our own hearts. The apostle told the church, I need you to stir the flame. And literally, you know, it's turning the coals so that the air can be breathed back on those coals so the fire can spark back up. The air is the Holy Spirit. We need to let God turn the coals of our heart. Let Him start searching and purging and dealing with our hearts and realize, man, I, I am missing the most glorious opportunity in eternity to be used by God. Now, let me just be real honest with you folks. Believers Fellowship, this has to be our goal. This has to be our purpose. That has to be our intent. That we are making disciples. Bottom line. That means we reach people for Christ. We teach people for Christ. We baptize many people. And we teach them to command all things that Jesus told us. That's making disciples. Everything we do has to be about reaching disciples. If it's the food pantry, the clothes pantry, if it's a women's Bible study, if it's a men's Bible study, if it's our lift groups, everything we're doing, children's ministry, it's all about making disciples. Bottom line. If you're looking for something else in a church, this ain't it. All right, you've got to go somewhere else. This church is about keeping Jesus at the focus of everything we're doing. It's not about building, building. Now, let me tell you something that may shock you. When we, the leadership of this church, get together, whether it's the staff or the elders or whatever we're planning, whatever we're doing, we're not doing it just because we think something ought to be done that's neat or that might be fun. Let's get together and have a watermelon feast. All right? Have a seed spitting contest. No. When we do things, it's ultimately to make disciples. Ladies, there's an event coming up this weekend. What do you think we're doing that? Because eh, Brother Joe wanted the ladies to have a conference. Well, Rebecca ain't got anything better to do than plan a conference. <laughs> Why do you think we're doing that? You ever thought about that? Got a men's conference coming up in about a month and a half. Why are we doing that? What are we doing here this morning? It's about fulfilling our purpose as the bride of Christ. We are the church. We, none of us are unto ourselves. We are united. We are committed. And what we do, and this is going to hurt some people's feelings, so get your Kleenex out. All right. What we do, we must do together. It requires faithfulness. It requires loyalty. It requires commitment to Christ, to the body, and to, his, to, to our Lord. But, you know, I'm continually amazed by people who are very faithful church members that many times when you have something that we can springboard and reach a lot of people and make a big difference in people's lives, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get people to come. You know? You know I, I don't have the patience for it. You know, I think I thank God there's guys like Philip Dutton who'll go out there and just keep bugging some of you to do what you need to do. You know? You know, I say, how many men are coming to that? I say, I don't know, maybe 10. You know, and we'll sick Philip loose. <laughs> He's going to go pressure some guys. 
shouldn't be that way, should it? Or that some lady has to go pressure all the other ladies to do something? That doesn't make any sense, spiritually speaking. Why should somebody have to twist your arm to do anything in your church, in your fellowship? But it, we can all get that way, can't we? We can easily slide in that direction, isolate ourselves, individualize ourselves. And here's the part about it. We get haughty about it. I'm spiritual. They're not. Yeah, we see how spiritual you are. You just gave it away. <laughs> you just showed your colors, you know. And it, it wasn't bright red. It was awful yellow. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I think so often as a church, we lose sight of what we're the church. And the church has a responsibility. And the church is on mission. And the church is about something. And too busy, we, we separate that off and we look at our little schedule. Well, I got time for this. I got time for that. You know, or I can go to church. I'll be there this month, a week or two. You know, like it's something that we just, I mean, Jesus died for the church. He gave his life blood for the church. We can't give 10 minutes a day, a moment often for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, his means and mechanism, and it's, it's his way of reaching the lost. I would say that when we have events, you understand the importance of these things, whether it's camp, whether it's mission trips. It's all for purpose. It's not for our entertainment. We may be entertained by it. I mean, we may be blessed by it, but that's not the bottom line. It's for others. Ladies, 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 we're having this event. I hope you enjoy it, but you will miss the mark if you're not bringing somebody. If you're not encouraging somebody, if you're not thinking right now, who have I not invited? I got some good news. We're going to have this awesome conference. God's going to be there. We've been praying. For weeks we've been praying. People have been praying and fasting, preparing, sending out letters and invites and phone calls. What have I done? Eh, not much, but it's going to be fun if I have time. It's your church. Do we not think that we have to account for this one day? You think you're not going to have to account for this? Certainly we are. We're here in the kingdom. We're the kingdom people. We're the kingdom church. We have re kingdom responsibilities. Let's fulfill them. Let's be what God's called us to be. With, with our men's conference coming up, you know, what are we doing that for? We just got to have something on the calendar to do. <laughs> no. We're going to make disciples. I, I tried to share with our men uh, here recently. I can, I, can, I can envision myself sitting in a room. Three or four hundred men worshiping God, praising God. Guys coming to the altar, weeping, getting saved. Other guys getting right. Guys reconciling their marriages, getting right with their children. I see that in my mind, don't you? I see that in my heart. Only one thing will stop that from happening is our unbelief and our lack of commitment and our lethargy. We can do this together, whatever it is. If it's Sunday, we can do it for the glory of God together. We need to have intent and purpose and design and passion for what God's called us to do. Otherwise, folks, why even come? Now, I know some of the brothers, Joe, you need to be more a little sensitive. There's somebody going to be upset about that. <laughs> Ain't nobody more sensitive than me. Amen. I realize the ramifications. I realize what's going on. I want you to, and I want us to do it together. And I want to, you know, I want, us to, I want us to be like Nehemiah. You know, Nehemiah went and built that wall in 54 days. There'd been, how many other people have tried it over, over the last 400 years, nobody could get it done? You know how he did? He went there and told, hey, you guys messed up, the wall's a mess. You're going to live like this? You're the people of God. We're going to live like this? We're the people, we don't live like this. This is a, this is a, a dishonor to, to the Lord. Let's get this wall built. We're God's people. We're God's, we're God's voice in the world. Let's do what God's called us to do. And that, that was the appeal. Shame on you. Let's get after it. <laughs> Let's get after it. Every man and every man's household, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it corporately, jointly, together. And you know what happened? It, 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 they all got built 54 days. Oh, there were a lot of opposition. There was all the naysayers. You know, you got those, those guys, Sam Blatt and Tobiah and those other guys. I, I love Nehemiah. I said, just, just keep working. Don't pay attention to them. Amen. You know? 
And if they come at you, hey, have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, you'll be all right. <laughs> they came to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, we need to have a business meeting. Nehemiah said, I ain't got time for that. I'm about a, a great work. We're about a great work. Do we realize that? We're about the greatest work of all. Hallelujah. We are. There's nothing greater than what we're doing. Why? Because we're doing what Jesus was doing. Amen. We're doing everything we can to reach the lost world. So let's, let's do that. And let's do it with passion. And let's do it with a burden. And let's do it with conviction. And let's do it with, with grace. And, and let's do it with the honor and the glory of God at, at stake and at the heart of all that we're doing. Yes. Do you not know that you've come to the kingdom today for such a time as this? Let's rise to that occasion. Let's take, let's take it by storm. I'd like to do this. Just remain seated, except all the women that have already registered for the conference, I want you to come right here just for a moment. These girls already have about close to 100 women already.